Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Julie Walker. New Yorkers will be voting in the general election on Tuesday, November 6th. They'll cast their ballots for offices including governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, and members of the state legislature and United States Congress. The U.S. House of Representatives makes up half of Congress along with the U.S. Senate. The U.S. House of Representatives creates and passes federal laws. Other duties include introducing bills and resolutions, offering amendments, and serving on committees. Each member of Congress in the House of Representatives is elected to a two-year term serving the people of a specific congressional district. Today we bring you a debate with the candidates running for New York's 12th congressional district. The 12th Congressional District covers the Upper East Side in Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn and Queens. The winner of the general election will take office in January of next year. Joining us today is Democratic candidate and incumbent Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, Green Party candidate Scott Hutchins, and Republican candidate Elliot Rabane. We're going to start in the middle with our Green Party candidate, Scott Hutchins. What three words would you use to describe yourself as a politician or as a candidate? Uh, I would describe myself as progressive, uh, focused on per people's issues, and ready to represent the people. We're going to move on to the incumbent, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. What three words would you use? Progressive, hardworking, and effective. And your challenger, the Republican, Elliot Rabin? Yes, ma'am. Old guy, fresh ideas, ready to rock and roll. Okay. What steps, Mr. Rabin, have you taken um, to um, understand the social and the economic needs of the approximately 700,000 people living in the various neighborhoods in your district? One of my platforms is the divisiveness and the socioeconomic divisiveness, not only of my district, but of my country. I'm in business in Manhattan for 41 years. I'm not a politician. I have watched the homeless. I have watched the downtrodden. I have watched the people who became very wealthy and lost everything. The biggest problem we have, and one of the biggest problems we have, is the socioeconomic divisiveness. I wish I had enough time to explain how I could rebalance my ideas about rebalancing our society when it comes to that. A couple of things, YRC, Youth Reaction Corps, DPC, Domestic Peace Corps, and all these things would be service oriented to our country and require our young people to understand the civics and history of our country, improve the education of our country, which has, been, which has become since the 60s, when we were around four, five, or six, and now we've dropped to an average of 24 to 36, depending on the subject matter of science, math, and English. That's a wrap. Now on to you, Congresswoman Maloney. What steps have you taken to understand the social and economic needs of the 700,000 people in your district? Well, first of all, I, I interact with the people that I represent. I represent three boroughs, uh, uh, parts of the east side of Manhattan, Astoria, Queens, and uh, Long Island City, and Williamsburg, and, and Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, so with community meetings, uh, uh, meeting people and through friends, uh, uh, studying uh, demographics and, and studying uh, the census data on the needs and, and, and priorities of the district and trying to get an accurate count so we, we get the proper funding and, and uh, representation that we deserve from the census. Uh, I have uh, most of the ideas in, uh, that I have come from the people that I represent. I've authored and passed over 70 bills, including some landmark ones, such as the Credit Card Holders Bill of Rights, uh, which according to the Consumer Financial Control Board, has kept uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 billion in consumers' uh, pockets a year uh, based on 
cutting back on unfair, deceptive practices by financial institutions. I call it the Maloney stimulus package because it's keeping the money in, in the people's uh, that I represent's hands. Uh, uh, the the 9-11 uh, uh, health and compensation bill named after Detective Zadroga brought uh, well over $8 billion for the health and, and needs of the first responders and, and others that were affected by, by working and being exposed to the terrible 9-11 incident and and my Debbie Smith bill has been called the most important anti-rape uh, bill in history uh, providing uh, funding to uh, to really process and and computerize and organize uh, the the the, uh, the 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 reviewing DNA kits and and rape kits uh, and 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 by doing so getting the proof to put people that are rapist uh, behind bars uh, so I, I work every day uh, not only on understanding the district, but also in reacting uh, to the problems that they present me with. Mr. Hutchins, what have you done to understand the people in your district and to understand the, the needs that they have? Uh, I've been an activist with numerous groups, uh, including Picture the Homeless and several uh, working groups of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I also worked with Community Voices Heard. I, I, with, when I was with Picture the Homeless, I, I worked on a white paper uh, that details the uh, the abuses uh, in the shelter system. Uh, it's people are, uh, who are in charge of the nonprofits that operate shelters on behalf of the city are making enormous profits. The results are not getting to the homeless people. Uh, I've also uh, gone to Albany and I've lobbied, I lobbied with the offices of State Assembly members Millman and Teal uh, dealing with the work experience program, helping to get that overturned. That, that was a situation in which people who were receiving welfare benefits were forced to work at a rate that was equivalent to 29 cents an hour oftentimes. And so they were basically enslaved because they were on welfare and we, we, ha we needed to end that. So it's. Deal, dealing with the people, working with organizations uh, that are dealing with issues like income inequality and, and union issues and various things like that, that I've been really trying to get involved and really understand what's going on, uh, how, how this imbalance is occurring and how it can be corrected. At last count, there were more than 62,000 homeless people in New York City. In fact, you can't leave your house and walk down the street without at least seeing one person. So if elected on a federal level, what can you do? Uh, my plan is to implement uh, Utah's Housing First policy. Uh, we would need to adapt that to a national level because that, that policy is to put people in Housing First because there's too much profit in the shelter system, at least in New York. Uh, these nonprofits are really making a lot of profits. A lot of, in a lot of cases, half of what they're, they're getting from the city is going to uh, top executives who run these so-called nonprofits. We need to stop that. We need to put people into housing and then address any issues they might have because particularly in New York City uh, one in three people living in the shelter system is employed so basically homeless shelters are the housing for the working poor now and I myself am one of them I live in the shelter system and I have for the past six and a half years and it's strictly an economic issue there's not enough housing that people can afford in this city and people are being evicted uh, especially in the Bronx and being forced into the shelter system so we got to stop forcing people in the shelter system build housing that people can afford there's too much profit motive there's only there's oh we can't make enough money if we if we rent to, to these low-income people and then we give these people tax abatements and then we say that we're making affordable housing and it's not really affordable some requ still requires six figures even though they call it affordable we're gonna get to affordable housing in a moment but let me um, go to your opponents mr. Rabin the issue of homelessness what can be done on a federal level I've experienced homelessness at a personal level in my business I have watched people sleeping all over town we have clothed them we have given them footwear etc and we ask them why aren't they in a shelter? The shelters are dangerous. I don't have a depth of information on what can be done at the federal level, but I know that as a human being and as a person who has a heart, that with all of the incredible amounts of money that we call the so-called one or two or three percenters, that there's plenty of money available. How it's administered is another question. The gentleman mentioned the nonprofits. Well, when you see a nonprofit CEO making five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, is that nonprofit? 
So my answer to you is, it is a community effort, it is a city-wise effort, it is a government effort, and I don't have all the statistics that my opponents have in my hands, but I will find a way, a fair and equitable way to take the people off the streets. Bottom line is I had two women, a mother and a daughter who were Holocaust survivors, come into me and how they found me, I don't know. And they, would, they owned property, but due to landlord greed, they're not able to move into their own homes and they're sleeping on a bench inside of their own property. Okay, on to Congresswoman Maloney. What can be done on a federal level? I would say that affordable housing and housing in general, including homeless housing, is one of the most pressing issues in the city of New York, probably the, the biggest one. Uh, and the first and foremost is to preserve the housing that we have. The public housing, uh, working for more federal investment there, the federal uh, tax credit for the building of affordable housing. I am pleased that just two weeks ago in my district, uh, uh, the mayor awarded uh, 550 new units of affordable housing to be built in uh, Brooklyn at the old hospital site, which I've been pu pushing for for a long time. We need to preserve our our rent protection rights, our tenant protection rights, the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, uh, rent control, the MCI uh, protections. These protections need to be put in place. And we need more of a federal program and support uh, for the homeless uh, initiative too. But but right now we need to preserve uh, the affordability of the housing we have and too often the housing that is being built is unaffordable. So we need to preserve not only what we have, we have to, have to preserve the programs that help uh, build affordable housing and, uh, and it should be a priority. It is a priority of mine. Okay, did you have anything, since I promised to go back to you, Mr. Uh, Hutchins, did you have anything to say on affordable housing? Yes, uh, there's a problem with the way affordable housing is figured. It's based on the area median income, which is overestimated by including uh, Nassau County, uh, Rockland County, and Westchester County. The average income in the five boroughs is about $53,000, and housing that's being marketed as affordable often requires you to make between eighty dollars and sometimes even over $100,000. Uh, and there's almost none of this so-called affordable housing for anyone who makes under $40,000 which the employed people in the shelter system are mostly people making under $40,000. There's no housing for these people. They, they, they rely on vouchers. They're a source of income discrimination because there's very little enforcement in terms of the, the mayor's voucher system. So we need to actually make housing that these people can afford. We can't be get, relying on tax credits to make this ha housing that's more expensive, less expensive, when there's still a major profit involved. They're basically taking from the taxpayers uh, in order to supposedly house these low-income people, but they're not actually doing it because there's almost no housing for people who are, who are in the categories of extremely low income, uh, very low income, and low income. Most of the so-called affordable housing is intended for people who are considered median income uh, up, up in the lower ends of high income. So. Uh, the problem is the definition of affordable is very nebulous. Uh, Mr. Rabin, what steps do you think need to be taken? Do you have any solid plans on um, increasing and maintaining the number of affordable housing units? First of all, you have to deal with an incredibly bloated bureaucracy. Recently, the NYCHA, the housing, have hired 10 people and added to a bureaucracy, and those 10 people are making in excess of six figures a year, and we're trying to find out why. Do I have a specific plan at this moment? No, but I will sit and gather the information from those people who are affected by affordable housing. And by the way, the average income in the five boroughs is not 50, 60,000, it's close to 70. And that should be enough to be able to live in the five boroughs, but very, very quickly, it's becoming not enough with a family of four to live in the five boroughs. My specific plans would be to ensure that the waste is taken care of. Your problem goes back down to the old simple thing, waste, waste and more waste in a city that spends a fortune and the results are not what they should be. We need more affordable housing. We, we need to uh, 
more of a city, state, and federal commitment. Uh, I've been fortunate to put up uh, six uh, new uh, buildings for, for affordable housing for seniors. Uh, that was based largely on uh, the 202 program, which they've cut back. I have a bill in to restore that. Uh, and also the Home Loan Bank has also provided funding to, to make this happen. Uh, there are various uh, programs on the federal level for, for tax breaks for affordable housing. But uh, oftentimes it's the definition. Uh, sometimes the definition, uh, people can't afford the housing that they say is, quote, affordable. So it, it really has to be uh, slated for, for people that, that, that can, can afford it. I've been successful in getting several RFPs through uh, the city the, for affordable housing in the district that I'm privileged to represent. And a large component of affordable housing in my district and throughout the city is uh, public housing. We need to preserve the public housing. We need to upgrade it. We need to invest in it. And we need to uh, really take care of this housing that we have. I was on the city council for 10 years. And when I was there, the waiting list was uh, over 900,000 to get into public housing here in the city of New York. Uh, so preserving the, the housing we have, uh, we don't have enough of a federal uh, commitment uh, to housing. There's been a disinvestment uh, through uh, administrations, uh, several administration since I've been in office and and we need to to work hard to bring that up but we also need a city and a state commitment also we need to protect the tenants and the rights of tenants uh, so that they can afford to stay where they are so certain bills such as the MCI the the affordable housing act the uh, the uh, the the uh, the, 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 the vacancy decontrol needs to be stopped. There, there are so many ways that we can preserve the housing that we have. We, we need to do more, and I'm working on it. Okay, Mr. Rabin, let's talk about the environment. What are the three biggest environmental concerns in your district, and how do you plan to tackle those? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think it was a huge mistake for our country to withdraw from the Paris Accords. I personally experienced flooding. I think that global warming is a fact, not a fiction. Right now, for example, a company named Siemens out of Germany is working on a way in which you can, excuse me, which, a way in which you can reduce carbon signatures of automobiles, people, et cetera. And again, it's a matter of sitting down, crossing the aisles, talking to experts, and, and actually, when you see private people, the city of New York, for example, doing Sandy, the east side was flooded, it's still not fixed. The subways were flooded, still not fixed. There are major government uh, projects to work on global warming, but it's come to sort of a stop with the withdrawal of the Paris, from our withdrawal of the Paris Accords. Uh, I think the biggest problem, you can see it every single day, we have more and more disasters, and more and more floods, and more and more hurricanes, and more and more forest fires. This is all a result of global warming. You take a look at California, you take a look at Florida recently, you take a look at New Orleans, still not recovered. Bottom line is it's again a huge problem, and it takes a lot of intelligence and a lot of people willing to sit down and forget about their personal views and their party views and sit down and solve the problem. Mr. Hutchins. I'm very much in line with the Green Party's national platform. We need clean, green energy, green jobs. We need to divest from fossil fuels. We need to ban hydrofracking. These are all important issues. As, my, as Mr. Rabin said, uh, a lot of these issues with the hurricanes and the flooding and the forest fires, they are all the result of climate change. People want to deny climate change, even though the 3% the, the of studies that deny climate change aren't even consistent with each other, whereas the 97% that say there is anthropogenic climate change all pretty much in agreement with each other. They're all very consistent with each other. We need to stop caving to these corporate lobbies that profit from polluting. Um, we just need to divest from these fossil fuels because we're, we're over there fight. We're over in the Middle East it's killing civilians, basically, because we, we want these fossil fuels uh, because we haven't invested enough in other alternative sources of energy. And we need, we need to really do whatever we can to, to get off those fossil fuels before it's too late. 
Congresswoman Maloney, what are the three biggest environmental concerns for your district and how do you plan to tackle them? I, I would say in, in my, my district in, in, in both uh, Queens and, and Brooklyn, it's the Newtown Creek, uh, which is a, uh, a, an environmental disaster. Uh, one of the first actions I did when I went to Congress was to write the president requesting that uh, they be designated as a super fund. And they have been designated as a super fund. So we are working with the federal government to try to clean this up. It was designated by the Obama administration, but it has been years of uh, abuse and, and problems. Uh, I'm working with the neighborhood groups that are involved in, in those areas uh, and trying to get uh, uh, funding for professionals to work with them and uh, for, with specific goal, uh, goals that, uh, that they have. Uh, also, the, the flooding that we had uh, in all of the boroughs, all three boroughs that I represent because of Sandy, uh, one of the responses is that we changed the law that when you rebuild, it used to be you had to rebuild exactly how it uh, was built before. We changed it so you could change it for the 21st century, uh, put the generators on the top floor, not the bottom floor, and we secured over 350 million in FEMA money for, for a resiliency study to study ways that we can protect our uh, borders in, in case of another Sandy or the next Sandy that comes. And, and uh, the city of New York, along with the federal government, are, are working with a plan with uh, levees and burns and, and, and ways to uh, try to protect us as, as we go forward. Uh, one of the great tragedies it was, the, was when uh, the current administration pulled us out of, of, the, of the Paris Accord. Uh, 179 nations came together to combat global warming. Uh, believe me, uh, 179 nations aren't wrong. Uh, we should be part of that international effort to combat global warming. We'll stay with you, um, Congresswoman Maloney, for this next round of questions on gun control. Do you think there should be any restrictions on owning a gun, and if so, what? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I truly believe that uh, if gu more guns made us safer, we would be the safest nation on earth. We are alone in the number of mass murders and mass attacks on our people. Uh, other countries like Japan, China, even Russia have gun safety uh, laws, common sense ones, that doesn't uh, violate the Second Amendment but that we have in our country, and they don't have these type of shootings. They don't have this type of slaughter. I have a series of bills in, roughly eight, and I, I am supporting others. First and foremost, we should have background checks. We should ban assault weapons. They're only used to kill people. They're not even used for hunting. Uh, if we banned them once, it worked. We should re reauthorize that legislation banning assault weapons. Uh, these massacre magazines that allow them to go into movie theaters and clubs and, and mow down people, uh, they should be banned. And, and we, don't even, we don't even treat the selling of illegal guns as a felony in this country. It is an outrage. Uh, Border Patrol testified before Congress, and I put in the bill, give us the tools to combat uh, trafficking in illegal guns for, uh, at the border. Uh, give us the tools. Make it a felony. We haven't been able to pass that legislation. One of my bills, they, they literally had a situation where you could not even study gun safety. And I put in a bill, there's nothing uh, controversial uh, that is so controversial you can't study it in the United States Congress. Finally, that was changed, but they have not funded uh, gun safety studying. And we study uh, car safety all the time. It has resulted in saving lives. And uh, I have a bill in that you would have uh, liability insurance on, on your gun. We have liability insurance on cars. Guns are far more uh, dangerous. And it would uh, instill and motivate people to be safer with child locks, lock the guns up, and other things you can do to make it uh, safer. I'm endorsed by uh, uh, Moms Demand, uh, uh, vi Moms Against against violent guns and, and the Brady Bill and, and every town against guns and and it is a priority of mine to work for gun safety. Since Mr. Rabin? Gun safety. It's a, an issue close to my heart. I collect guns. I am 100 percent in favor of gun control. I find it difficult to fathom that an organization named the NRA is able to control the Congress of the United States 
Wonder how that happens. Well, we won't go there right now. Bottom line is an AR-15 is a weapon of war. A magazine over five rounds is not necessary unless you're used doing police work and you have SWAT teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most people don't realize that the velocity of a bullet from an AR-15 is in excess of 3,000 feet per second, which means this. If it hits you in the finger, it'll shatter your arm. So yes, I'm in favor of gun control. There's an old saying that bad guys will be eliminated by good guys with guns. Well, you'll always be able. A bad guy will find a way to get a gun. We need universal gun control, consistent gun control throughout every single state in this country. You need background checks. You need mental checks. You need trigger locks on guns. But stocks should be eliminated completely, where you can turn an automatic weapon, a semi-automatic, into an automatic weapon. Okay? And there's other ways that people turn semi-automatics into automatics by filing down a firing pin. Most people don't realize the damage that this stuff does. And I agree with my opponent in that there should be locks because you have situations where a kid picks up a gun that his father forgot to put away and he kills his brother by accident, period. Mr. Hutchins, your feelings on gun control? Uh, my feelings are very similar to both of my opponents. We had an assault weapons ban in this country at one point. Uh, there's been a direct correlation in the rise of mass shootings since that assault, and assault weapons ban was lifted. We need to look at what other countries are doing. For example, Australia, um, they had a mass shooting. They more or less banned guns. They haven't had a mass shooting since. England, it is the same way. These are, I mean, these are close allies. These are not... Um, some obscure, these are not obscure little countries that have low population density and things like that. These, these are very much Western countries who are very similar to us in most of their outlook. Uh, we, need, we need the bump stock ban is a no-brainer. Uh, we need to get these main thing, money out of politics. We've got the NRA with far too much influence over the Congress, over the Senate. That's the issue. It's, it's, there's, there's too much gun manufacturing lobby is trying to put, has enough money that they can put this influence in and we need to stop them. Mr. Hutchins, we're going to stay with you, but we're going to move on to another topic, women's rights. Roe versus Wade, if revoked, would leave New York State with antiquated reproductive health care laws. What would you, what steps would you take, if any, to protect Roe versus Wade? Well, this is a really important issue because if we if we have the Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade, that's going to be a lot of and it's going to be a major problem, especially for low income women. Um, wealthy women are always going to be able to get abortions. These abortion laws are almost exclusively for the benefit of lower income women because lower income women are not going to be able to travel to other places to get these operations done. We already have an issue all over the country where women simply don't have access to abortion clinics unless they travel. If they don't have money, they don't travel, they can't have the abortion, they're stuck raising that kid. The problem on the right is that a lot of times they, they, they want to cut benefits and so forth and they, they, want, they want to force women to have children. Some, some of them even want to, to legally make women a vessel for children when they're pregnant and just basically say the woman has no rights and that's a serious issue that comes from the more extreme sectors of the right that we have to stop. And the, the important thing is that people have to have access. If, if you have to travel 50 miles from your home to get an abortion and you're stuck raising a kid that you didn't want, that's a problem especially when the government is not providing benefits to these people because as long as they're not they, they want to force women to have these children but they don't want to pay for it and that's the bottom line. Congresswoman Maloney? Oh, this is uh, something that I work on every day in Congress. I, I used to keep a scorecard on efforts to roll back Roe v. Wade when it got to be 350 that had passed 
the House of Representatives and ways that they are chipping away at a woman's right to choose, a, a woman's right to, to access in uh, numerous ways uh, uh, chipping away. I, I, I feel that Roe v. Wade is uh, absolutely fundamental. We need to codify it here in New York State, and there is a bill before the state legislature for that, and we need to fight tooth and nail. A woman is not uh, really free or equal, and, and if she cannot decide uh, when she is having children and the health care, reproductive, reproductive health care that she decides with her uh, husband and doctor uh, and to take that right away from her I think is absolutely uh, outrageous. Uh, um, Roe v. Wade is now uh, it is now accepted law. It's a constitutional law, and I, I will continue to, to fight to enforce it and to protect it uh, and, uh, in any way, shape, or form. And I, I agree with my opponent. Uh, the opposition party, the Republicans, will go and fight tooth and nail trying to take away a woman's right to make choices about repro her reproduction, uh, and yet they won't provide any services uh, for the children. Uh, the, the number of the services are not there for, for poor women and children and for foster care. They're not there. So they're not supporting the children that we already have. So uh, this is a fundamental right uh, for healthy families and a healthy future and certainly for the health of women. Mr. Rabin? I am 100% in favor of Roe versus Wade. And hopefully our Supreme Court will have the common sense to leave a constitutional law alone. I grew up in an area in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was not far from a place called the Florence Crediton Home for Unwed Mothers. And I watched ladies who did not want children give their children up for adoption and then change their minds. I simply believe this. A woman's right to choose is a woman's right to choose. I think when you have a whole bunch of men, Republican, Democrat, Regardless of who, what party it is, it's none of our business as a man. It is the business solely of a woman in charge of her own body. So I basically agree with the two folks on my right. Bottom line, it is a woman's right to choose, it is a woman's body, and it's time for us as men to understand that we are all equal, period. Staying with you for this next question, there has been a recent call to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. What is your opinion of codifying the equality of men and women in the U.S.? I agree with it 100 percent. There's not much to say. We're equal. We're equal under the eyes of God. We should be equal under the eyes of one another. It's very, very simple. Uh, if you ask me if women should fight in a war, if the choice is there for them to fight in a war and they're physically able to do it, that's fine. If they're physically not able to do it because it becomes a burden for the soldiers with them, then it's not so fine. Right. We look at the example of Israel where everybody seems to think that they're in direct combat. They're not. Okay? There's a physiological difference between men and women, but not a psychological difference. Mr. Hutchins? I think it's a national embarrassment that we haven't ratified the Equal Rights Amendment yet. It should have been ratified a long time ago. Uh, there's a conservative element that, that wants to deprive women of their rights, and we need to fight that because that, that's, they're, living, they're living in another time period that's really, I just find it morally bankrupt that we, ha that we have not ratified this amendment. It's been, it's been around for decades, and there, there's been no ratification. It needs to be codified into law. Ms. Maloney? One thing the Kavanaugh hearings taught us that we may not be able to control who's appointed to the Supreme Court, but we can control the document that they're allowed to interpret, the Constitution. We need to pass and ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, women's rights should not be dependent on who's on the court making a decision or who's in the White House, who has the majority in, in the House of Representatives. Their rights should be uh, in the Constitution and protected. And you couldn't help but compare between uh, when uh, the, 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 when 
Thompson's went on the on, on the court and the, the Anita Hill hearings and Dr. Ford's hearings and how little has changed. We're still at 80 cents to the dollar after 27 years. It hasn't been enforced the equal pay for equal work. That's so unfair. If you had an equal rights amendment, you could enforce it. And women who have sued in cases of rape have gone to the Supreme Court when there was no question. They've confessed, yes, I raped her. And they throw it out and they say they don't have standing to sue. With women in the Constitution, there could be laws that would allow them to have standing to sue to protect uh, themselves in cases of sexual violence. I, I don't think anything is more important, and I hope to be able, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, to work incredibly hard to get this bill ratified. We need one more state to ratify it. I hope it's Virginia. And then it would go to the Supreme Court. If they don't uphold it, we have a backup plan. We've got another bill in, ready to go. We must get women in the Constitution. It's the most important thing we can do for the future of our country and the, the protection of our women and children. Moving on to immigration, um, Mr. Hutchins, what is your position on New York as a sanctuary city or a sanctuary state? Uh, I think New York needs to retain its position as a sanctuary city and state. Um, I really opposed to Trump imposing any sanctions against us for doing so. We are a nation of immigrants. I mean, even people who have been here a long time, I mean, I'm ninth generation American born, but we're basically immigrants. We came, we came over. My ancestor was an employee of the Massachusetts Bay Company, and so, he, I mean, he just came over. We need to simplify the, our immigration procedures. Our, our, it's ever since the 70s, our, our immigration laws have become more and more draconian, uh, and now Trump's wanting to build this border wall. We, we started building a fence in 2006, which my opponent voted for, and that, that's an issue as well that we need to deal with. But we need to make this a safe place where immigrants can come, especially when we're at actually attacking their countries and making them unlivable, or we're installing dictators that make their country unlivable. In a lot of cases, we are responsible for a lot of the immigration that occurs because of what we've done to their countries. And therefore, we need to have sanctuary cities where these people can go uh, when, once, we've made, once we have made their countries unlivable. Congresswoman Maloney. Well, first of all, point of personal privilege. I, I, I have never voted for the Trump wall, nor do I support the Trump wall, which is in divisive, uh, uh, really combative language that is very un-American and, and anti immigrant. Uh, one of the values of this country is that everyone has the right to be an American and really all of us uh, are immigrants. If you're not a, a native uh, born uh, American Indian, uh, all of our ancestors came here fleeing something, some type of oppression and uh, we're unique as, as, a, as a country of immigrants and, and immigrants have brought a great deal uh, to our country. Now, now your question was what? It was how you feel about New York being a sanctuary city, sanctuary state? Well, New York is, is a, a sanctuary city. We have uh, honored uh, immigrants. Uh, we are probably one of the most diverse cities in, in the world, and it has made our country stronger. Uh, we don't care who you are or where you came from. We want to know what you can do, and it's one of the things that have made our, our great country and our great city uh, so great. If you look at the number of businesses that are founded by immigrants, the energy and, and the productivity uh, that they bring to our country, we have laws and procedures, and, and we should honor those laws and procedures. I, for one, have been part of a democratic coalition that has worked for comprehensive uh, immigration reform, which would give a path to citizenship for the so-called dreamers, those that came to this country as, as children who know no other language, no other life, and have are, are been educated and part of this country. They should be allowed to be able to contribute and, and give back to this country. And I, I certainly hope that that's part of a immigration reform bill that we can bring forward uh, in the legislature. Uh, we, are, we are a nation of immigrants, uh, and uh, it's part of our DNA, it's part of our being, and our city has always opened its arms from the Statue of Liberty from when it was first put there to this day uh, to immigrants, to refugees, and those that are seeking and looking for a better life. Mr. Rabin, what are, are your feelings on New York being bring a sanctuary? Bring me your poor and downtrodden, so says the Statue of Liberty, et cetera. Sanctuary cities, I do not agree with sanctuary cities. The immigration problem is a lot deeper and a lot more discussion than is 
available in the time allotted here. If you open the floodgates, the floods will get larger and larger and larger. I am not against immigration at all. I am against, I am against illegal immigration. When I see a gentleman that worked for me for 35 years go before the judges and the courts in Brooklyn, New York, and swear allegiance to the United States of America. It was one of the proudest moments of his life and my life. He had three children. One is now a major person in the police force. One is now a major hedge fund person. And the third didn't work out so well, but he's still a good person. Bottom line is this. We need to get to the border. We need to not let these folks come into this country the infrastructure of the United States of America cannot absorb a million a year, a million plus a year, and over and over. And if you allow the first three or four or five thousand to come in, you're going to have to allow it all. My solution is simple. You need to go to these so-called sovereign countries. And by the way, we did not install a dictator in Venezuela whose president is eating steak in Turkey while his people are eating one meal a day. Bottom line is we need to fix it in these countries. We need to negotiate. We need, as T.R. said, Teddy Roosevelt, you need to speak softly and use the stick. And use the stick of aid. Use the stick and say, hey, you either fix your country or we may have to come and fix it for you. I'm not talking about war, but I'm talking about using economic means to try to help these countries help themselves, thereby helping their own people. Human rights is their job. Elliot Rabid, we're going to stay with you for closing statements. All of my opponents here today have a whole lot more statistics than I do, 20 years, 30 years. What I have is this. I have a feeling that we need to look at three things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What does that mean? It also means when a lobbyist comes to me, and says, hey, I gave you $100, what can you do for me? I said, nothing more than thank you. Thank you very much because I feel that you're supporting me because I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I can define that. I don't have the time to define it. But I will say this. The other answer is government by the people, for the people, of the people. We're right now in what we're calling a cold civil war that the other day at the synagogue in Pittsburgh turned hot. The other day at the Republic, last night at the Republican headquarters turned hot. We need to get rid of labels. We need to say to ourselves, what is this? Why are you supporting a party, any party, in any segment of this country whose ideas are an anathema to the country that you live in, whose ideas lack common sense, whose ideas do not go along with the Constitution of the United States. In today's world, Lincoln would be a Democrat. In today's world, Teddy Roosevelt would be a Democrat, and so on. So once you get rid of the labels and you talk to people on a day-to-day -day basis, they will say to you, I don't care about the parties anymore, all right? And I would like to say something to Mrs. Maloney. I want to thank you for all these years. You have so many bills, I don't know how you can keep track. Of all I them bills. Them. Well, I tell you, your staff <laughs> must be so cool because I certainly couldn't keep track of all the stuff that you quoted today. Bottom line is, if and when you retire, a sort of a rumor like that, I'd like you to help me cross the aisle and help me meander through the walls and halls of Congress. Mr. Hutchins, your closing statement. Uh, I'd like to say that District 12 needs a change. For too long we've been represented by a very conservative Democrat whose progressivism seems limited to some of the most fig leaf issues. Maloney voted for the Financial Services Modernization Act and Commodities Modernization Act which led to the 2007 through 9 crash that has pushed even the educated into low wage work and caused homelessness to skyrocket. She voted for Bush's war on Iraq and continues to have a voting record for war spending leading to the genocide on brown people. She has no respect for the Bill of Rights co-sponsoring Schumer's unconstitutional Israel Anti-Boycott Act that would imprison people for exerting a fundamental First Amendment right, just as she voted to curb our First Amendment rights, voting yay on the Patriot Act, yet is yet to co-sponsor the bipartisan bill, uh, which is House Resolution 138, uh, to end the U.S. support of the Saudi war on Yemen. 
And uh, as I said before, unlike 131 Democrats, you voted for the 2006 Secure Fence Act, which is a prelude to Trump's border wall. So, and she also agrees with him on the Iran deal. So those are, those are issues that we need to deal with. Uh, she also hurt unions by voting for permanent normal trade relations status with China. Uh, I'm in favor of restoring the Glass-Steagall banking restrictions, and that would expand democracy. Uh, and we, I agree with her on the Citizens United issue, but we need some of the most important things. Um, housing first, universal health care, progressive taxation. We need some genuine prison reform. Uh, we, we need to um, end the drug war, legalize marijuana, re release all nonviolent mar marijuana offenders. We need to ban hydrofracking and abolish ICE, and we need to stop the wars. We are attacking eight countries now without a declaration of war, including Niger, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. So we need to, we need to stop those, and we need to elect someone who's in favor of these more progressive issues. I, she, she's done an excellent job in some things, other things not so much, and a lot of the times those are dealing with the more underlying issues, and I, I think we need to address some of these more underlying issues that she either has not done or she has voted for things that have a negative consequence on the people. Thank you. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, your closing statement. First of all, a point of personal privilege. Um, I, I am on legislation to, to end the war in, in Yemen, and I have been part of every democratic effort uh, to reform our financial system. Not only have I been for it, but I've been part of the, the team that has gotten it through Congress, the Dodd-Frank bill that was a reaction to the 2008 downturn that helped put our country back on the positive steps that we're doing now and growing and providing jobs uh, uh, for people. Uh, my credit card bill of rights uh, was the first reform and only reform really of the credit card uh, system and, and it, as I said, brought into consumers' pockets over 10 to 20 billion a year. I would call that one of the strongest, if not the most important, uh, consumer protection bill in the last decade, and, and have been part of uh, all of our efforts to bring uh, accountability and oversight uh, in so many ways. And, and now to my closing uh, statement. I, I first of all would like to thank uh, MNN and also the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to have this debate uh, forum. I believe that this uh, election is one of the most, if not the most important election in my lifetime. It is the first time that we've been able to vote since 2016 to change the course of this country. So first and foremost, I wanna urge everyone to get out and participate and vote in these midterm elections. If we are fortunate enough to win a Democratic majority in these midterm elections, I, I would like to share some of my priorities. Uh, first, uh, massive oversight on the Trump administration. They have gotten away with too much for too long in this Republican-controlled uh, Congress. Uh, secondly, to uh, preserve affordable and avail available uh, health care, the Affordable Care Act, uh, and to lower the cost of prescription drugs, and to preserve Social Security and, and Medicare. And, and thirdly, a massive influx of uh, funding for, for infrastructure uh, to provide good American jobs and, and uh, build our competitiveness as, as a nation. I'm proud of having brought federal funding for the Second Avenue subway, the L train, the Kosciuszko Bridge, uh, the Eastside Connector, and many other projects. Uh, fifth, we need, to, we need to pass and ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. We should not be dependent on the whims of who's on the Supreme Court or who's in the White House or in the majority in the Congress on women's basic constitutional rights, which should be their rights, of equality of opportunity, equality of protection, and equality of, of, of voice. And we need to preserve our, our human rights and, and our civil rights and campaign finance reform. When Citizens United went into effect, there was 145 million in congressional races. The end to Citizens United that has endorsed me said there is now over 44 billion in uh, 
federal campaigns and you don't know who the money's coming from. You don't know who's trying to influence the government. Uh, campaign finance reform, uh, accountability, oversight, transparency uh, has to be an absolute uh, priority. Along with uh, climate change, we need a, a green, uh, we need to restore the green efforts that we had in place to promote uh, that. And also gun safety. How dumb can you be not to have common sense gun safety uh, laws? My time is up. I just uh, hope you, I, I ask for your vote so that I can continue working for you and, and working for the change that we need Thank in you our city and country. All. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. The general election is on Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on voting, on locating your polling site and all the candidates, you can visit our website, racetorepresent.com, or the League of Women Voters website, lwvny.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.